Okay, I thought it might be interesting to explain what I've been doing with my last few days. My uh, wife was kind enough to stop off at a warehouse that Cambridge University Press uh, keeps, and she essentially partially runs and picked me up a few books that intrigued me very much, all of them actually, in a way they're almost a summary of how I've spent the latter part of my life. This particular book called Buried by the Times is not about somebody's funeral, actually. It's about how news is constructed. And when I read it, I had a, you know, a f kind of feeling of sadness. And the reason why it made me sad was that I could see how well it would fit into my historiography course. Because one of the things I've um, been emphasizing with my students is the manifold ways in which you can ignore news that for whatever reason you find unpalatable. One of it is to not to print it at all, but that's not nearly as subtle as burying it so that nobody ever looks at it. And this is such a wonderful example of what was going on, you know, on during the years of the Holocaust in the New York Times being essentially owned and published by German Jews are very sensitive about um, sharing the depth of the horrors of the Holocaust with their readership, feeling that it might alienate them. Like good, good Americans might feel that their sons and daughters were dying for the Jews, <laughs> which of course would be appalling and make the whole you know, sacrifice meaningless. Um, so the sensitivity here uh, is is quite interesting. The, the question that Laurel Leff, who is the author uh, of the book and a, obviously a very talented journalist herself, uh, her point is how the news is constructed. And even that is a wonderful subject for the class. That the news isn't just out there, as the Times says, everything that's fit to print. What they should say is everything that we think you know is useful to share with you according to our own standards of what's valuable and what's not. That would be much more accurate, but at the same time, uh, for some people, a little bit distressing. I don't mean to be distressing at all. I just want to get at the way things really are, as does this author. And she begins the book with, with something very powerful. It's um, a, called The Last Communication from the Abyss that came into the New York Times uh, you know, purview from Poland fairly near the end of the war. Um, let me describe it very quickly and expeditiously if I can. Uh, the abyss that they're talking about, of course, is the total annihilation of Polish Jewry. We're talk the numbers we're talking about here is over three million. And apparently in all of Poland, you know, after there being um, well over three million Jews, only 250,000 were left. And this report from the abyss was a plea to save the last quarter of a million who were scheduled for annihilation. The New York Times, you know, authenticated, you know, the news report as accurate, but they didn't print it on the the right side, you know, first page, or the left side, first page, or anywhere near the first page. It was somewhere buried in page four or five or six after news that was about people turning their license plates in and things like that. I mean, it, it's their, their decision was that this was just not important enough news to, to feature so that people couldn't miss it. The irony of that is you know, beyond delicious, it's insufferable. <laughs> and it's so uh, representative of the way news is reported in general. I guess that's the kind of generalization I want to make, but I won't accuse Laurel of having done that. <laughs> because she doesn't tie it into another, you know, statement that she makes at all. She doesn't really blend these two things together, and I think it sh they should be. And that is that when it comes to reporting, um, you know, domestic political news, the alpha and omega of domestic, you know, political news in this country are reports that emanate from the White House, which are printed without question. 
you know, like there's no interrogation of the the sources, their validity, their importance. They're just printed verbatim at literatum. And I see a, a close connection between these two processes. I think that they're two sides of the same coin, and I felt that that was worth mentioning and a kind of insight into my nature, and that is that I'm, in many ways, you know, beyond the pale, crossing over, and my instincts don't change at all. I'm always thinking, how can I talk to my students about this? <laughs> so that it gnaws at me, keeps me awake. <laughs>
and almost always they're self-enhancing. So what this sort of blends into is this notion about can you use a kind of objective scientific method, you know, to, to determine which is the wheat and which is the chaff? Well, um, such a method has been claimed to exist, or at least maybe methods rather than one method. But in the end, you know, like everybody has their agenda. So uh, the arguments that are most successful are usually rhetorical, not rational. So, you know, it's who comes up with the most persuasive case. And all cases really are persuasive to the extent that they move minds. And logic chopping is really not one of the primary modes to move minds, you know, like even if, so what I'd say is that no, the answer to that question is no, we can never get beyond, um, you know, interest, interest is always there, determining which direction we go in, which we try very often by whatever means we think we have a disposal to conceal it. That's really where the art is, by the way, is concealing your own objective, which is um, not the truth, you know, as it is in some, um, what, trans-historical, uncontaminated, perfect form, like a God's eye view of the world. Uh, no, that's not really the objective. The objective is creating other knowledge for other people to assimilate in your interests. And can you get beyond it? Well, I mean, I don't know if there's an answer to that question. Because the cleverer a person is, the easier it is to show where the agenda is in almost every argument. In almost every argument. I would include then, if, as you said, truth isn't found in a text, but in, through inquiry. So but even the results of our own inquiries will be tainted by our own agenda. Yeah. And yeah, that's right. And you know, that goes back to, you know, this notion of power and knowledge and their relationship to each other. We like to believe that this is, you know, perfectly formed knowledge out there, which is part of the world, not ourselves. You know, it's in the object, not in the subject, and that we could somehow uh, access it. I think that's very naive, to tell you the truth. You know, like, it's wishful thinking. And I, I guess it's partially my own wishful thinking, because, you know, I was once, you know, I once thought that way myself. And there are moments when I do now. It's not so hard and fast. It's just that, you know, you read people and you can see, you know, they show you how rhetorical an argument that purportedly is objective and rational is. I mean, it's so easy. You could just see it. You know, you could parse a sentence and see the hidden concealed motives. By the way, you could also see that talking to your friends. If you want it in a, a less formal plane, they'll, they'll tell you things like, this is what I, why I'm doing this. These are my motives. And if you talk to them long enough and ask them enough questions, you'll see that they're not their motives at all. Their motives are really to manipulate you. Which brings us back to the classroom again, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's so neat. It's another turning point back again to the same place. And that is this notion that what we're doing with children is, uh, you know, like enlightening them and uh, nurturing their developing minds and hearts when actually what we're doing is proselytizing and indoctrinating them to accept the world that's ours, so they won't make waves, which is just another form of oppression. And then we tell them how we're liberating them, as in uh, that famous panopticon of Jer Jeremy Bentham's, where uh, you know you have a, a kind of mechanism where one eye could watch thousands of different, you know, individuals <laughs> while they think they're alone and not under surveillance until they internalize the eye that watches them. So then you don't even need to watch them anymore. And that's what uh, we do. We tell them, you know, uh, our students, that we see through them, that we know all their tricks, that 
they themselves are not, you know, at a point of sophistication where they can understand what we understand. And also, it's always for their own good. Always. It's never from our own good. You know, like, it's f for them to be as much like us. So it's power over them that we get and we call it knowledge. It fits pretty well, doesn't it? If I specifically tried to manifestly teach children not to accept what they're told in the classroom as truth, I would probably run afoul of my employer, no matter who that employer was, because the schools themselves are dedicated to indoctrination, and all their mechanisms of discipline are based on indoctrination and mind control. And it's, it's really under the cover of, you need this treatment. You see, like without this treatment, you're going to flounder in the working class. <laughs> You'll never enter the managerial class without me. Oh, you will not be a morally, you know, like formed individual because your brain has to develop to the point where you can understand moral arguments. And of course, I understand them. And the, the part that's so easily deconstructed, shown, is the person who tells you that does the exact same things you're accusing them of doing. The hypocrisy comes out on the slightest touch. You really have, you know what it's like, a house of cards, you just have to blow on it. And you'll find out that, you know, when they're supposed to be working and preparing for class, they're out in their cars, driving around on a pretty day, not, not preparing for class. And you yourself are, you know, hunting the zipper or whatever, you know, young people do. Lucky them, you know, like, and you try to make them feel guilty about it for not fulfilling their responsibilities, you know, or, you know, engaging in controlled substances, you know, which scandalize you. Of course, you know that you were unconscious most of your four years in high school, you know, like, but you somehow conveniently forgot because you've been unconscious the last four years as well. So uh, what you are is a hypocrite and a liar. And not only that, you're also disrespecting the people that you should respect the most. And that's the young. Because they are in your charge. And the, and the least you could do is treat them with respect. But instead, you swear allegiance to things like the, the unconditional efficacy of retributive justice. You know what that means, retributive justice? I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a fancy way of putting a very simple idea. Um, and most, most conventional schools are based on this principle. Negative and positive sanctions are absolutely necessary for students to do anything because you've assumed that the material that you teach them is intrinsically uninteresting. So the only way you could get them to do something is uh, rewards and punishments, which sometimes take the most um, infantile forms, which are insulting by their very nature because it's dog or cat training, not human being dealing. And that is you get a punishment for you know, not doing this. Like the not doing this is not going to class. You wouldn't go to class unless you were going to be either rewarded or punished for doing it. What is it? What's the message of that? I mean, how long do you have to think about that? The message is that class isn't worth going to. Isn't it? Honestly. And you're assuming that they're going to sleep through it because why wouldn't you sleep through your own class? In fact, you do sleep through your own class. That's the part that's so beautiful. So what's, what's the end? What's the payoff? Who are the students that are most appreciated by teachers? And this is up in the college and graduate school level, too. I'm not talking about just younger people. Who do they like the most? The, te the, 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 the students who do what they're told and make the least waves for the teachers. Those are the ones that are awarded. The good citizens, right? The mature ones, the mature ones, you know, who have a sense of what? What do they have a sense? What is, what is maturity in a young person from the point of view of a teacher? Unconditional acceptance of the teacher's agenda in class, making their lives easier. That means that they're mature. So the less thinking you do, the more you're rewarded. Every student, I think, who's ever gone to high school or junior high school have noticed that the ones that the teachers privilege and give all the awards to 
are not even among the second or third tier of intelligent, you know, like colleagues of theirs. That is one of the truisms everywhere. Because you don't reward the kids who think you, they're your enemy. You know, like, and thinking is, is a problem. Because the first person who's going to be discredited is you. <laughs> you see what I mean? And then, you know, so then you create a whole structure of false objectives. And, and your job is to internalize those in your students so that they repeat them without being forced to do it. So early on in these interviews, I said that uh, knowledge becomes power when it's transmitted to somebody else so that they use your language. So a young person never uses the word adult to refer to themselves. Once you have them thinking that way, that they're some way deficient or unformed, you've got them. That's what I mean by power. They're yours. My teaching legacy is a little bit different. I don't need power over my students. I have it already. Just by walking into class and showing them that I have an active mind and that I care about them and that I think that they're worthwhile. And they know I won't lie to them. So I don't need this kind of artificial bullshit. I don't have to put them on because they're already excessively generous with me. You know, they're incredibly indulgent, but then I'm indulgent of them. So it's a kind of a, a pleasant mutual admiration society. <laughs> and that's the heart of teaching, actually. To give a young person the sense, a feeling, that they're privileged to be where they are, that they're lucky, and that something interesting is actually happening to them. That the eyes will be opened. 